Seven stocks I'm buying January 2024 edition. Welcome in, folks. We are about to get into the seven stocks that I'm planning on buying January 2024. We're going to get into my bullish thesis on these stocks, the risk-reward profiles, how much money I'm looking to put in these stocks, what I think the return profiles could be of each of these stocks, and uh, all that good stuff in today's video. Now, this is the very first video I'm producing in 2024, so I appreciate every single person for being here as always, and uh, including this is my favorite series I do each and every month on this channel. Three quick things I want to get into before we get into these seven stocks and why I think these stocks have tremendous upside is one, I just want to wish every single person watching this video a very happy new year. I hope you have a great 2024. I want to thank everybody for always smashing that thumbs up button. Thank you for being subscribed and joining me year after year. I appreciate each and every one of you. Okay. Now, uh, second thing I want to just discuss real quick here is it's likely going to be a good year for the stock market in 2024. It is never a hundred percent guarantee, but it's a high probability. Whenever you have a back-to-back -back years where you have a 10% plus move, one on the downside, one on the upside, every single time in the last, you know, we can call it many, many decades, it's always a good following year, which means 2024 should likely be a nice green year, probably a 7% 7, 7 to maybe 19% return for the S&P 500. Now, that key, once again, that could not be true, and maybe there was always a first time for everything, right? Maybe this is the one time it's not, and also, uh, maybe we get a very volatile year, where at one point in the year, the stocks tank big, uh, you get some great buying the dip type opportunities, and get to scoop up some shares for some uh, very, very attractive pricing, right? There's already a ton of deals out there. So just a little food for thought in regards to that, okay? And lastly here, if you're looking to join my private stock group in 2024, then the pinned comment down there will be to apply. Uh, what do you get access to when you join the private group? One is you get access to all my private course curriculums. You get access to the six and seven figure Discord chat with myself and everybody else in there. You get access to the public account, which is nearly $2 million now at this point in time and the moves I'm making in there each week. And then you also get private exclusive videos every single week. So if you want to go ahead and apply for that, check out the pinned comment and uh, you can join us in there. All right, guys, what's the first stock up here? Okay, the very first stock is... Alibaba, Baba, 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 first one of these seven stocks. So my five-year holdout is officially over as of this past week in regards to Chinese stocks. It is officially over. Now, where do I want to play? If I'm going to play uh, Chinese stocks, I want to be in the big beast of China, and that is Alibaba. Now, when it comes to Baba, it's very important to understand it's a very diversified business model. They have their Taobao and Tmall group, which is their massive kind of more e-commerce, uh, let's call it side of the business, right? They have their international commerce business, which just think about it as outside of China, which they do a lot of business outside of China, as you can see in relation to you know this, this current numbers here. They also have their local services group. They also have their logistics network. They also have a big cloud division. And they have digital media and entertainment group as well. And you can see all these businesses are experiencing very nice growth. T-Ball and T-Mall, that's kind of the smaller growth segment, 4% there. And then their cloud segment has been really weak, only 2% growth there. And these, now keep in mind, all these numbers you're looking at here, these growth rates, 4%, 53%, 16%, 25%, 2%, and 11% for total 9% revenue. This is on a bad year for Alibaba with a bad Chinese economy. So do keep in mind... Uh, uh, whenever, let's say, the Chinese economy turns around, things are much better. Just keep in mind that Alibaba's growth rates are going to probably be quite significantly above where they're at right now. This is all on a bad year. Now, if we look at adjusted EBITDA, that was up 18% non-GAAP diluted earnings per share, up 21%. So they're growing that at a faster clip. Then obviously they're growing their uh, top line, which is something I definitely like to see here, right? Now, here's some of the facts around this company on a bad year. They're growing their top line 9%. They're growing their bottom line double digits, right? And so you got to think, like, if I have a company that's growing this rapidly, right, even on a bad year, where should the P.E. ratio be on a stock like this? 30 40, 50, right? You think minimum 20, but usually you're going to think if I, if I just gave you those growth rates, you'd be thinking, okay, probably a 30, 40, 50, somewhere around there, but minimum 20, right? Well, check this out. Here's the insane thing with Alibaba. It's trading at a forward PE of eight, 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 okay? And following your number seven. I mean, that's just ridiculous for a company that has these sorts of growth rates, even on a bad year. I mean, that's, that's startling. Startling to think I'm getting this stock for this cheap. This stock could double, could literally 2x tomorrow, and the stock would still be extremely undervalued. 
there's not many companies in the market you can say that that stock 2x is tomorrow and it's still significantly undervalued. Alibaba is one of the few because even if this was at a 16 forward P, it would still be extremely undervalued given its growth rates and diversification of this business model overall, right? Now, in these uh, latest earnings, they announced they're going to do a, a dividend, $2.5 billion, right? Which... What do I, how do I feel about the dividend, right? They're gonna, they're gonna pay out their first ever dividend to shareholders. How do I feel about this? Well, personally, as far as how I feel about this, right? And by the way, look at this. The, the group has plenty of firepower at its disposal. Alibaba ended the quarter with $63 billion in net cash and has generated $27 billion in free cash flow over the, over the past 12 months. And that's during a bad time, right? Incredible. So how do I feel about the dividend? Here's how I feel. I love this, okay? I think this is a great decision by Alibaba. I think it shows, um, you know, a lot of trust from both sides. And so I think this is phenomenal. I think this is one of the best decisions Alibaba can make for their shareholders over coming years is announcing this dividend because there's a trust factor that needs to be built up in relation to, you know, a company like Alibaba and let's call it shareholders around the world that are looking at a stock like this and they're like, man, I love it, but I got to build the trust. This is a huge shake the hand moment in my personal opinion. So I think this is, this is one of the other things that put me over the top as far as conviction about like getting back in uh, relation to a Chinese stock like an Alibaba after being on a five year plus holdout. For, I've been on for these stocks for a long time, right? Now, also the perfect timing. This is perfect timing. Like I'm about to get back into Chinese stocks at the same moment that everybody has given up on these stocks. Like literally foreign investors have completely given up on Chinese stocks. So they've all, you know, given up on these stocks now at this point in time. And here I am there to scoop up and scoop in and say, okay, you know, y'all gave up on these Chinese stocks. Awesome. It's my time to go ahead and scoop up these shares for just ridiculously undervalued valuations here. It's perfect, perfect timing. Okay. Now, you know, here's the deal, right? I'm going to talk like Alibaba. It's been it's, it's such a last, uh, you know, tough past several years, really three years for a company like this, right? And I remember last year at this time, everybody hated Meta, right? Everybody sold that stock. It's a great company, but there was kind of like peak fear and bearishness around Meta. And there's a very similar phenomenon going on right now with Alibaba, right? And obviously I came in and I scooped up those shares because I looked at that and I'm like, this is silly. Like people are selling these, this stock off for dirt cheap prices. This is just ridiculous. And I came in and now I'm up $421,000 on those shares in this portfolio, right? And so with Ababa, I see a very similar phenomenon where I'm like, everyone in that's wanted to sold the stock has sold the stock now at this point in time. It's a great company. And it's like peak fear bearishness in regards to this while I'm looking at what's going on geopolitically. I'm like, this is actually going in, in a um, company like Alibaba's favor now at this point in time, right? So the question is, how big will I go in relation to a stock like Baba? And I could probably take this up to maybe a $50,000 position in terms of amount of money I put in. Do I want to take it to six figures plus in terms of amount of money I put in? No, because there is still a little bit of the trust factor there, right? But um, as far as how I feel, I think the Chinese-U.S. relationship is going to get stronger and stronger over the coming years. China really needs the U.S. U.S. has been moving a lot of manufacturing outside of China. Uh, U.S. really needs China as well. They hold a lot of our debt, and we need them to buy a whole lot of debt over the coming years. So I think both sides are going to need each other. I think they're realizing that. I think that's why Xi came to the United States, which was the first time he'd been to U.S. soil in years, years. And he spent a lot of time with U.S. politicians. He spent a lot of time with uh, big tech moguls. And, um, you know, he realizes, oh, man, China really needs uh, China really needs the United States. And like I said, the United States needs China. So the relationship's going to be mended, in my opinion, over the coming years. And I think it's going to bode very well for an Alibaba. And so, uh, yeah, really excited about that one. I'll build it into a decent sized position likely here in 2024. And the great thing is the stock's so undervalued that even if the stock went up to a hundred bucks, I'm still going to be buying. It could go to 120. I'm still buying. Like this is so undervalued right now. It's like, it's so far from being a, at fair value that I'm like, dude, this is easy. Scoop up the shares. The shares okay. Alrighty guys, so that's Alibaba. Second of the seven stocks that I'm likely gonna be buying in January 2024 is Nike. Just do it. Nike, Nike. I love Nike, okay? Uh, stocks had a very volatile past five years. I'll put it like that, very volatile. I mean, it's got been a decent return of 40% over the past five years, but been very volatile, okay? 
I love Nike. It's such an easy ownable stock, I call it. If I think about easy ownable stocks, stocks I don't have to worry about, just sleep well at night type stocks, you know, some of these stocks come to mind, right? Costco, Texas Roadhouse, Starbucks, Microsoft, Nike. Stocks like that come to mind when I think about easy stocks to just own. Like if your grandma said, hey, go buy some individual stocks, you're like, okay, I gotta go buy some individual stocks. These are the type of stocks you think about. Like just easy stocks to own, right? Like, like I love these sorts of companies. And so Nike is in a very beautiful situation right now, okay? If you look at Nike's revenues over the years, it just goes up and up and up. Every once in a while, they have a pullback and then they go right back to growth. A pullback and then right back to growth, right? I mean, that's phenomenal. Growing from, you know, less than $14 billion of revenue back here in 05 to now doing $50 billion plus dollars in revenue nowadays. It's incredible, right? And a very consistent company. In terms of their net income, it can fall here and there and then it comes right back. And then it will fall and it will come right back into new bigger numbers, new bigger numbers, right? And so recently, we've kind of been in a fall period. I think over this next couple of years, you're gonna see a massive comeback in profitability to whole new levels that you've never seen in regards to Nike, right? Nike controls one of the most valuable brands in the world. You, you can put it up there with the Apples and the Coca-Colas and the Amazons and the McDonald's and in all the most valuable brands you can possibly think of, Nike's right in there with those guys. Here they rank them the ninth most valuable global brand in the world for this past year, right? It's just, that that's special, right? And, and if I think, you know, I, I, I took a peek at, beside my bed, I have all my shoes I wear the most. So I'll have other shoes I don't wear that often in, in the, the, the closet, right? But in terms of next to my bed, I have, you know, just certain shoes that I'm like, this is a high probability I wear these shoes every single week, right? And what do we find? Nike, Nike, Nike. These are like a basketball shoe, Kevin Durant. Nike, uh, Nike, right? And then I got these shoes because I heard really good things about them. I think they're made by Asics as far as like for a longer distance running. So I wear those usually once a week. And actually, this is a brand new pair. Uh, actually, a private, a private stock group member just sent me this past week to my PO box. Uh, it's an Adidas pair, which by the way is very comfortable. And so, you know, all my like most active shoes I wear, Nike, 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 right? That's a phenomenal brand there. And I think that could be said for a lot of people out there. Now, a huge opportunity for Nike over the coming years is China and India, right? And so as more and more folks reach the middle class in China, reach the middle class in India, which <laughs> I mean, those markets are just dwarf the size of anywhere else in terms of population, right? More and more folks in the middle class is going to be more and more kids and adults are going to get into working out, into athletics, where, you know, that just wasn't a thing. For a lot of Chinese citizens over the decades, that, like working out wasn't a thing. Like going to the gym wasn't a thing. And same thing with India, right? And and getting in organized sports and things like that. That wasn't a thing in the past, right? But it's starting to become a thing. And if you think even about the United States, let's go back, let me take you back in time to like the 1980s, for instance, right? In the 1980s, if you went to the gym, you were like a freak. They're like, what? You, you go to the gym? Like you go lift weights? What? Like, that wasn't a thing like people did. Like, that was, you were, you were weird if you went to the gym in the 1980s, right? And especially any time period before that. And nowadays, I bet you the majority of people watching this video right now, I bet you you have a gym membership. The majority of people watching this video right now, I bet you have a gym membership. Now it's like the normal to like be in the gyms, right? So this is all bodes very well for companies that sell athletic type clothing like a Nike, right? Also, participation in sports varied by uh, parents' education, right? And what you're going to find is the more educated parents are, the more likely they're going to have their children participate in uh, sports as kids, right? Which that bodes very well for a company like Nike as well, right? It bodes well for other companies that sell into this product group. But keep in mind, the more educated people get in China, in India, the more likely they're going to have their children then enter into obviously sports of some kind, right? This is the numbers in the United States over the years. And obviously, I mean, it's crazy. Bachelor's degree or higher, almost 60, you know, 67 plus percent of parents will have their kids six, six to 17 play some sort of organized sport. But that's incredible, right? Versus high school or less, all the way down there to 36%. Massive difference, right? Now, the U.S. opportunity is still massive. This is the size of the youth sports market uh, worldwide in, in you know 2022 through 2030. But I mean, my gosh, just in the United States is still a huge opportunity as well. Never mind on a worldwide basis, right? Now, no one can compete with Nike because they don't have the bankroll. They don't have the bankroll Nike has to buy up athletes 
in, in the top tier athletes or the top tier, let's call it musicians or whoever, right? Nike even does a lot of deals with some of the biggest musicians in the world. They actually have deals with Nike as well. It's incredible, right? But they're so smart about how they go about everything. This company is so ingrained into understanding things at such a higher level of chess than anybody else understands, right? You probably don't know who, I bet you most people watching this video right now, you have no clue who this is. Who I got on your screen right there, like, I don't know who that is. That's Sydney McLaughlin. And you would know her if you ever watched the Olympics. And I'm sure she'll be a superstar come this uh, Olympics as well, right? And no one really probably pays attention to her unless you're really into track or you watch the Olympics. But you see her crossing the line and you'll probably see her win again this year and probably break some new crazy record, right? And, you know, where, what are the logos all on her that you're going to see and your mind's going to register as all that success as she crosses that line and breaks a new record and breaks her old records and, and all these things, you see these Nike symbols everywhere, right? And so you see that in, in your mind, whether you realize it or not, is basically kind of being like uh, programmed of like thinking of success as somebody that is wearing Nike, right? Which makes you then want to go get Nike products because it makes you feel success, right? Now you might think, okay, so the Sydney McLaughlin, she's got to be, she's clearly got to be signed to Nike, right? Look at all these Nike symbols all over. Well, no. She's actually signed a New Balance, but Nike's so smart that they basically have the rights so all the U.S. athletes all have to wear these Nike symbols all over them, even though, even though she's actually signed a New Balance. Isn't that phenomenal, right? Do you know who this is? I think a few more of you people might know who this is right here. His name's Steph Curry, one of the greatest basketball players ever. What a shooter, right? Arguably the greatest shooter in the history of basketball. And... Every time this man goes to the NBA Finals, wins another championship, wins a game, breaks another record, you see all these Nike symbols all over him, right? Nike, Nike, Nike. And so you think, oh man, this, you know, you, once again, your brain subliminally putting together the success with the Nike, and you might think a guy like this is signed to Nike. No, he's not. He's actually signed to Under Armour for a massive deal. But what does everybody associate him with? Well, if Nike symbols are all over his uniform, they're associating Steph Curry with Nike, not with Under Armour. So he's got this big Under Armour deal, but unless you really know the details, you wouldn't even know the man signed to Under Armour. You'd think he's a Nike athlete based upon the fact that every time he goes to shoot a shot, he's got Nike symbols all over him. Isn't it amazing? This is a company that plays at a higher level and they got a bigger bankroll than anybody else can even participate with, right? No. If we go ahead and look at this company's EPS expected for next year, uh, analysts, and, and when I'm saying next year, I'm really talking about 2025 fiscal year because their fiscal year ends weird for Nike. It ends in the middle of the year, uh, around May. So yeah, I'm really looking at 25 fiscal year numbers, right? Which would be this coming May through the next May. Analysts have them doing 426. Uh, they have it at about 25 forward P on this stock. I think the number's way low. I think they're gonna do way more than that EPS there. And the, one of the main reasons is Nike just announced here uh, about a week ago or so is that they're going to do about a $2 billion cost cutting plan over the next year or two. And so you're going to see Nike's EPS, I think, skyrocket in quite a substantial way, uh, starting in the back half of 2024 and moving into 2025. So I think this number is way too low. And when I say way too low, I mean way, way too low. I think they're going to be way more profitable than that. Now, on top of that, if we look at this latest quarterly results, there was a lot to like there. Gross margins increased 170 basis points for the company, which is a fancy way of saying 1.7 percentage points, which is good in this environment. I can tell you that much. Inventories for Nike were $8 billion. That's down 14% compared to a year prior. That's good. That's definitely good. We don't want to see Nike bloated with inventory. Cash and cash equivalents and short-term investments were $9.9 .9 billion. Great money on that balance sheet, right? Those are some very positive things. Now, over the past 10 years, Nike's returned a little less than 180%. I honestly think that's probably how the next 10 years will go. I think it'll probably be 100% to 200% type return in this stock over the next 10 years. Now, in terms of Nike, how many shares could I own this one? How big could I go? It's unlimited. I, I don't even have like a number of like, you know, there's a lot of stocks like an Alibaba, for instance, or other stocks that I'm like, I have to cap this stock at a certain sizing because, you know, I don't want to go too heavy because it's a little bit risky. Nike. I'd feel comfortable. I could have a million dollars in Nike and I'd feel comfortable. There's no amount of money that I wouldn't feel comfortable having in a stock like Nike. And that's one of the few companies I can say in the world that I feel like that, right? So I can go way bigger. And so don't be surprised if you see me pick up a ton of Nike shares in 2024.
already got some niche stock up here. Third of these seven stocks that I'll be looking to buy January 2024 in building out is Target. Target. It's been actually a pretty good performing stock. It's up 96% in the past five years. Now, do keep in mind, it doesn't even include all the dividends the stock pays out over time. So if you tack on that, the return's even been greater, right? Now, this is a pretty simple investment here. I don't, this is not some rocket science hidden company, right? They've got about 2,000 U.S. stores. They're always adapting their stores, always partnering. You see them partnering, even with companies like Ulti here recently. They do a phenomenal job, right? Now, when it comes to Target, I mean, look at the growth in this company over time. Yes, every once in a while, they'll have a pullback in revenue growth, but then they get up to a next level, a next level, and they just continue to grow that revenue year after year after year for, you know, they've done it for such a long time, right? Now, the thing I love about Target here is expectations are on the floor for revenue growth for this company for next year. You know, they're expecting the revenue to basically actually go down next year. That's shocking, right? Now, keep in mind, this past year, they were involved in some drama. There's not a very high probability they're going to be involved in any drama that next year. I can tell you that much. Consumer confidence is likely going to pick up substantially next year. And so because it, it, they're fi- the consumer is finally not going to be hit with inflation. So I'm looking at a, at a target situation here, and I'm like, these expectations are on the floor for this company. I think they're going to come in and blow these, these numbers out of the water in terms of revenue growth for next year. I don't think they're shrinking next year. I think they're going to grow substantially next year. And there's a big divergence between what analysts believe is going to happen here with Target and what I think is going to happen with Target here, okay? Now, on top of that, the company trades at about 15 times, uh, you know, forward P on next year's numbers. That's easy. That's an easy own. 15 times for, you know, one of the, the best companies out there, like easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Easy, okay? No, we also are starting to see a rotation of money, big Wall Street money, from Walmart starting to move into Target. This is a one-month chart for these stocks. The rotation has started. And why does this happen? Okay, why is there money starting to rotate from Walmart into Target? Well, I'm, this is a chart I'm showing you. All, it dates all the way back to 2022, the beginning of 2022 through right now, Okay. Now, Walmart's held together very well in this very tough inflationary environment, why Target has not, right? Target stocks really falter. Here's the deal, okay? Target gets hurt and Walmart benefits anytime the consumers hurt bad. The consumer can get hit bad from one of two scenarios. One is a scenario where inflation is very high and then people get very, very price sensitive and they move to a Walmart, right? And that's something we've definitely seen for the past, you know, let's call it, two years, or a situation where there's massive amounts of job losses, okay? We haven't obviously gone through a big job losses. Eventually, we will have that cycle of big job losses. Not today, I can tell you that, but it will be eventually, you know, whether it's two years from now, three years, four, or whatever, we'll have a cycle of big job losses, and that's when Walmart will benefit again. But when you're going into a 24, where you're likely not going to get any big job losses, and on top of that, inflation is not going to be a problem, Target's going to be the one who starts to benefit substantially. And you can see that in the stock price move there. And Walmart ends up kind of being the one that is quote unquote hurt in that sort of environment, right? Now, how big can, how big can I build Target position? Um, probably $75,000 I'd feel comfortable in this one, somewhere around there. So definitely a lot bigger than where it's at right now. And it's still a somewhat newer position for me. And like I said, Target's also a dividend payer. So it's nice to collect that quarterly dividend income, be able to throw that into more Target shares or throw that into other stocks in general, okay? All right, guys, fourth stock, these seven stocks that I'm looking to buy in January 2024 is PayPal. Still looking to add some more PayPal shares. So this is among my quote unquote best ideas for 2024, 2025 in terms of a stock. I absolutely love this one. I think the risk reward here is as attractive as I can possibly find in the stock market. I'm getting three great business models, I'm getting PayPal business model, Venmo, and I'm getting Braintree, right? Which is you know not as known by an average person, but I can tell you there's some of the biggest companies in the world use Braintree to run their financial transactions, their back end for all that finance related stuff, okay? So a very diversified business model. It's not like I'm just counting on one product that is like, you know, I probably wouldn't feel as confident if the only thing I was counting on is PayPal. The fact that I get PayPal, Venmo, and Braintree makes me feel so much more comfortable, okay? Now, 
Next thing is, companies growing revenues. Their latest quarter grew revenues 8% year over year. On, this on a non-GAAP basis, which is kind of the numbers we got to look at right now because they got a bunch of weird things happening on the GAAP basis at the moment. But uh, non-GAAP net income, 14%, so it grew at a far faster clip than revenues. And if we look at EPS on non-GAAP basis, 20% growth versus, once again, 8% growth. So I'm getting growing revenues, growing income, and not small amounts. Like These are large amounts of growing revenues and income. On top of that, I'm getting an income that's growing faster than revenues, which is something I love to see. Love to see that in a company, right? Then we got a proven executive who's just come in here at, at the company who came from Intuit, which is Intuit's one of the best business models in the world and one of the most loved stocks by Wall Street. So we got him now, you know, taking over the reins of the company, right? So I think he's going to move this company pretty darn quickly as far as, uh, you know, innovation over the next one to two years, I think it's going to be uh, pretty impressive from kind of what I'm hearing out of him. Now, valuations on the floor for this stock, I mean, it trades at, trades at 11 times next year's numbers. Like, come on, man, you've got to be kidding me. And by the way, those numbers are probably conservative, but 11 times, shh. they also double beat their latest quarterly results as well. So I bought a lot of shares of this stock here recently and I'm not done buying. How big can I make this position? I could probably bring it up to about $150,000. And that's in terms of money I put into the stock, about $150,000 I'd feel comfortable in the public account overall. So I love PayPal. I think it's gonna be a tremendous performer in 24, 25 and beyond. But uh, we shall see folks. Uh, the risk reward there is just so dang attractive. Okay, All right, next one up here. This is the smallest cap company I own, no doubt about it. It's the cheapest stock I own in terms of a, a dollar amount for a share. This one's pretty crazy, and it is Avant Brands. It's a 10 cent stock, yes, 10 cents. There's no smaller stock I hold than this one, okay? Don't let this stock price confuse you when it comes to you know the performance of the stock. If they see a down 11% the past year, you think, oh, companies had to do bad. No has nothing to do with the numbers. I'll show you the numbers. They're extremely impressive from this company. This just has to do with no one's wanted to own these stocks for the past three years. It's been a massive exodus out of all these Jack Jackson companies. All these Jack Jackson companies, everybody's left these stocks. Kind of like Chinese stocks over the past three years, right? So when it comes to Avant Brands, these are the latest quarterly numbers. Gross revenue, 7.5 mil, 61% growth year over year. Positive adjusted EBITDA. Positive cash flow from operations of 1.8 million. Fifth consecutive quarter of positive adjusted EBITDA and cash flow from operations. Uh, they, produced, they produced a record 3,268 kilograms of Jack Jackson during the latest quarter. As far as a CEO, he's very excited. Q3 2023 continued our trend of delivering strong year-over-year -year sales growth coupled with positive cash flow from operations. Furthermore, Q3 2023 was by far the best quarter for the Jack Jackson harvest which sets the stage for additional sales growth in Q4 2023 and beyond. So very, very exciting in regards to that, right? Now, in regards to a stock like this, how does it 10X, right? How does a stock go from 10 cents to a dollar over the next year or two, right? How does a market cap go from $27 million to $270 million? It's actually pretty simple with this one. And it's getting close to flipping to real net income profitability. And here's how a stock like that does it, okay? This stock's got to get to a place where they can produce three to four million dollars of net income per quarter, true net income, with still having revenue growth on top of that, right? That would put the company in a situation where they're producing, let's call it 12 to 16 million dollars a year in net income. If you put a 20 PE on a stock like that, which is very fair, especially if they continue to grow at these you know, insane growth rates, you're looking at a 240 to like 320 million dollar market cap on a company like this, and boom, there's the 10X. So that, that's, you know, an Avant brand story here, and that's how they get there. But for right now, still no one wants to hold these stocks because they've been net income losers. They, they've had, you know, net losses. And that goes for almost them and pretty much every stock in this category. Net loss companies, people say, oh, they're just going to keep diluting shareholder value. They're never going to get profitable, those sorts of things. And that's a risk with a stock like this. What if the stock never gets net income positive, right? If it never gets net income positive, it's going to be in a tough place, right? And so that's why a stock like this, I have to keep it a super small position. It's exciting that it could be that 10x opportunity over the next couple of years, but at the same time, I got to keep position sizing small. It means like 1%, 2% type position. And by the way, think about it. If, if there's a 1%, 2% position sizing for me right now, but it does do the big 10x, well, then it grows to a 10% to 20% position pretty darn quickly, right? Now, of course, the rest of the portfolio grows as well, but it goes to show you that 
for companies like this, if it really is that big opportunity, you don't need to put much in them because if it really hits like that, like it's incredible. It's like an Elf Beauty, right? Elf, Elf Cosmetics for me was a pretty questionable company when I invested into it, right? That's $7,200 or so in that stock and that, that stock's, you know, those shares that I bought for $7,200 are now worth something like, you know, close to $150,000. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see. But there is a big risk with that one. That's why I have to keep position sizing smaller just in case they continue to produce net losses for years to go in the future, okay? What do you guys, six stock, at least seven stocks up here. This one's tasty, this one's yummy. What is it? It is Cheesecake Factory, cake, cake, cake. Uh, Okay, so I want all the cake in regards to this one. I absolutely love this company. I think it's very well positioned over the coming years, okay? So first thing I wanna point out, this is Cheesecake Factory revenues over the years, right? Incredible, incredible. I mean, the company grows almost every single year. It's incredible the growth of this company over the years, right? Now, the other things I want you to pay attention to here is right here, this is a great financial crisis, right? They went through the great financial crisis. This is Rona when their restaurants had to be forced to be closed. And then recently they had to go through the drama of the highest inflation since like the 1970s, right? And yet, despite all these insane situations of the GFC, Rona, super sky high inflation, they've made it through to the other side and they keep their business model in a very healthy place. I value that. I value companies that can go through the toughest of the toughest times and still continue to grow their business year after year. That's incredible to me, right? Now, in terms of Cheesecake Factory, obviously they had their, uh, you know, famous, very famous restaurants. I mean, if you haven't heard, I, most of you guys watching this video right now, you heard of Cheesecake Factory. It's one of the most famous uh, restaurant chains in the world, like literally, like it's incredible, right? But on top of that, there's this North Italia concept, which has crazy big upside, crazy big upside. The way I look at North Italia, I look at it as kind of like an olive garden type opportunity, but the difference is with the North Italia, much better food quality. Like you can put North Italia versus the best of the best Italian restaurants and North Italia is gonna hold up extremely well where Olive Garden, all due respect, is not. Um, and the other thing with North Italia, um, it's definitely a higher price point than somewhere like an Olive Garden. Like many of the dishes at North Italia are probably running you anywhere from 20 to $30 versus an Olive Garden that's probably running you closer to 15 to $20, right? So something to kind of keep in mind there. But it, I mean, the opportunity for hundreds of locations over time is definitely there for North Italia. Now they also own all these brands as well. The Henry, Blanco, Doughbird, The Greenhouse, uh, Wildflower, Flower Child, Culinary Dropout, Flyby, Olive and Ivy, The Arrogant Butcher, Zinburger, and Pushing Daisies. Now I've tried several of these concepts because a lot of these concepts are in Arizona. Love this Blanco concept, it's like Mexican food. Doughbird, which is more of a pizza related restaurant. Love that one. Uh, Wildflower, I thought that was okay. Flower Child, I wasn't the like, biggest fan of Flower Child, but it does look like that could be the next giant after North Italia. Um, a lot of people love Flower Child. Culinary Dropout, I can tell you, man, they only get a few locations, but the locations do crazy volumes out of there. And they sell a lot, a lot a lot of drinks at Culinary Dropout. A lot of people like to use that as a fun place. It's a whole different concept. If you've ever been there, you know what it is. It's a whole different concept than the average place, okay? Olive and Ivy, I really wanted to go there, but it looked like it was uh, too busy the night I tried to call. Like, literally, they were completely booked out. They got a nice location in Scottsdale, Arizona. Zinburger, like that place. Some of the others I haven't tried yet, but I mean, the, the opportunity for more popular restaurant chains is immense for, for Cheesecake Factory. Now, Here's the deal, okay? I'm getting this company at about 11 times 2024 expected numbers. I mean, it's a, it's a top tier restaurant chain for that price. Eh, give me it all, give me all the shares. I mean, it's just, that's way undervalued, way too undervalued for a company like this. Like that's just ridiculous in my personal opinion, right? Now also the company is now paying out sweet dividends once again. They had to cut the dividend during Rona obviously because their restaurants were closed and it was that whole dramatic situation, right? And then there was like partial openings. It was a whole situation, right? So the company's back to paying sweet dividends out every quarter again, 27 cents a share they pay out every quarter. I think they're going back to where they used to be, which is 36 cents per share you own every single quarter. And uh, I think they'll take it above that over time. So Cheesecake Factory, how big could I make this position? And the answer is unlimited. I don't have, an, I don't have a limit for Cheesecake Factory. When I think about a company that you know, I could feel comfortable holding in recessions, in inflationary environments, everything this company's had thrown at it, including the most dramatic situation, which was Rona, closing restaurants. Like, 
I, I, it's no, there's no like limit I really even put on a stock like this, to be honest. I can hold as many shares I want to hold. And so don't be surprised if I continue to load up on shares of that one, okay? Last stock up here, number seven of seven that I'm likely be buying in January 2024. And I've owned a lot of these shares. So this one, it is Palantir Technologies. Take your symbol on this one, PLTR. Been a good performer over the past five years. Uh, well, actually, it's been public for less than five years, but 80% returner. Now, Palantir gives me no tears. I love Palantir, okay? Here's the deal. They have very successful products in several different verticals, whether we're talking dealing with military, commercial customers, whether we're talking about dealing with, um, let's call it other government-related entities. I mean, they have the products to do it. They have Foundry, which is very popular. They have Gotham as well, and they have Apollo. And so if you know Palantir, you know those three products there. But then they got the new you know, hot one on the market, and that's AIP. Activate LLMs and other AI on your private network subject to full control, which is something I think is going to be very needed by a lot of companies over these coming years. I mean, a lot of companies, because when you think about AI and you think about everything that's going to be going on there and you think about all the permissions that might be needed to access certain things... I mean, you know, somebody in your organization, you might not want access to this other thing over here while somebody else should get access to them. Even the AIs, you might want an AI to get access to one thing over here, but you don't want to get access to this other thing, right? And so I think AIP could be huge in the future. Now, AIP, a lot of people are trying out this product and it's making Palantir so much more relevant almost overnight. But they have these new AIP boot camps. And it's amazing because Palantir was always thought of, oh, it's such a slow sales cycle. Oh my gosh, like, it's going to take Palantir forever to sell to a customer. But now people are able to, to execute and use these AI boot camps in a matter of, you know, a couple days. They're able to start to see progress be made with this AIP and, you know, understand the product and be like, oh, I actually like this. Let me sign up for this, right? And then that opens up AI, you know, Palantir to obviously sell other products as well to this company, to these companies over time. So I've heard people equate AIP to kind of like a Trojan horse. It's kind of like a Trojan horse to ultimately sell maybe Foundry, right? So I think this is so understated for 2024 and beyond in terms of Palantir, in terms of these AI boot camps and, and just you know being able to have customers use it quickly and be able to get up and running in a matter of days. It's phenomenal, right? Obviously, the company's been scaling their revenues. Um, <clears throat> the thing that's going to be fun for Palantir, and let me grab a drink of water real quick. I need a drink. That was a lot of, that was a lot of talking. 30 to 7 minutes straight of talking with no water, okay? Who else is doing videos like this? No one. No, no one's doing no takes. Come on, man. This is all straight. There's not another person out here that could put on something like this. I could tell you that much, okay? Palantir. The company scales year after year. Big numbers are going to start to be pretty fun. Um, and the reason being is if this company can continue to put up, let's call it like 20 percentage type growth rates. And I know that there are some people that believe this company's going to get back to 30% plus. I'm not as convinced. I think 20 percentage is kind of going to be the number for the coming years. You got to keep in mind the numbers that Palantir is now at. They're, they're now doing multi-billion dollars of revenue, right? So it's a whole different scale than this company was when they were growing and it was like a few hundred million dollars of revenue, right? So as the numbers get bigger and bigger, as long as they can keep that growth rate consistent, the dollar amount is immense in the amount of that dollar amount that's going to hit the bottom line is going to be incredible for this company which is going to make it a cash flow machine a profitability machine right now analysts out there i don't know what they're looking at with palantir maybe i'm missing it or maybe they're missing it by a mile they only have eps growing for palantir 18 percent in 24 18 percent excuse me this, this is going to be their second year of profitability right so when companies are at the infant stage of profitability and that flip happens, usually over the next several years, you see an immense earnings per share growth. The fact that analysts are only at 18% makes me say, um, I, I don't think, I don't think that's right. By the way, I don't know what happened with my camera situation. Maybe we're not going to have a camera for the rest of this video, but uh, let's see what's going on here. What's going on? Should we, f there we go. Hey dude, how you doing? Let's see. Let's try to flip it back. Look at that. Look at that. That's technology. It's artificial intelligence. Uh, anyways, I think, I think analysts are massively off. So the company looks expensive 58 times next year's numbers. I think they're so far off, it's not even funny. They're not even looking at this. And this matters substantially, folks. If we take a peek here at the operating income of Palantir. So if we go back to the September 
2022 quarter, operating income was negative $62 million. Negative $62 million. They did a $100 million plus flip in the latest quarter to now $40 million of positive operating income. That matters substantially, folks. The earnings per share growth you're getting in this company on the bottom line is huge, but also this operating income, doing a flip like that is massive. And I think this is way understated with the company. We know they're going to still bring in a ton, I mean a ton, a ton of treasury related income for the company that's going to help the bottom line but the operating income now doing this flip and now we're starting to scale this i mean look at where we went from 62 million dollars in the negative to then 17 million dollars in the negative to four million dollars in the plus to then 10 million dollars in plus to now 40 million dollars on plus operating income plus you know treasury income is going to be coming in massively uh next year which is going to help that bottom line and you know the company's likely going to buy back a bunch of shares which is going to help take a lot of shares off the market which is going to help eps I mean, I don't know what analysts are looking at. We have a very big divergence of opinion. Analysts only have this company doing 29 cents of EPS next year. I'm like, I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. I mean, I think 40 cents to 50 cents is much more realistic. Which if you're talking about 40 cents to 50 cents, we're not paying 58 times forward P for this stock, folks. Okay? So in regards to Palantir... I already own quite a bit of shares, and I own this in other portfolios as well, but I own 5,555 shares here. The company is far safer than when I first started investing, and I can tell you that much. The fact that now they have an actual positive operating income, they got a positive bottom line now. I mean, the company is a far safer company than when I first started investing in the stock, so I would love to build up the position even bigger. I wouldn't mind getting this up to 7,000 shares or so in the public account and just owning more shares in general, folks, okay? So that is the beast video to start the year. What a beast, okay? Appreciate y'all joining me as always. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you everybody that smashed that thumbs up button. Thank you everybody that subscribed to the channel. Also, if you're looking to join my private stock group in 2024, fill out an application with the pinned comment down there. You get access to all my course curriculums, the Discord chat with the six, seven figure members, myself, uh, ability to see the moves I'm making in the public account each week, plus private exclusive weekly videos, okay? Pin comment down there to fill out an application and join us in there. Much love and have a great day.